At the time we're making this video, it's 21 years since a couple of modders called Min Lee and Jesse Cliff started mucking around in Half-Life's gold source engine and thought it might be fun to pit terrorists against counter-terrorists in objective-based multiplayer matches. Two decades and four major releases later, it's not just, you know, a big game. Let's put it this way, rare weapon skins from CSGO are worth actual thousands. It's arguably the most competitive and watchable esports series going. People have basically developed their own language for communicating in-game, and many of the maps span that entire period, meaning the likes of Dust2 are etched as inexorably into our collective consciousness as the walk from our old school to the sweet shop. With incredible enduring popularity and an unorthodox route into the big time, Counter-Strike is a game whose history is well worth delving into, particularly if, like me, your fetishism for the late 90s knows no bounds. So let's start right at the beginning. This story, like so many about PC gaming, begins with Half-Life. Valve released something momentous in 1998, a first-person shooter so absurdly ahead of the curve that it seemed to have been beamed into existence from a far-off planet, just like the aliens within its own Black Mesa research facility. Thank you. Yes, I'm rather proud of that one. It was the game of this pre-millennial build-up era, and what made it even more essential to PC gaming was the modding scene that sprang up around it. Valve released a level editor bundled with the game, which meant that even after you'd finished one of the best first-person shooters ever made, don't at me, there was an absolute raft of new fan-made stuff to play for free afterwards. Some of these mods, like They Hunger and USS Darkstar, were new single-player experiences that changed the theme and setting, and some of them were new multiplayer setups like Action Half-Life, which turned John Woo movies into online brawls, or Day of Defeat, which sends the gunplay back to the Second World War. And then there was Counter-Strike. Honestly, even though we were spoiled for choice in 1999 with what to install next in our Half-Life directory, this one was the most popular nearly immediately. While everyone else seemed to be making sci-fi adventures or wacky add-ons, this was a game that reveled in realism, and that really made it stand out. I know it doesn't really look like that now, but even the fact that the guns were real and the counter-terrorists were based on real military forces was a big draw back then. From its earliest versions as a rough beta in June 1999, the elements we'd still consider essential were in place. Buy your weapons and equipment before each round, fight to either plant or defuse a bomb, or squabble over some hostages and when you die, you stay dead until the end of the round. The map design and weapon behaviour were fantastic for the time too, but I really think it's that combination of your death meaning something and the tactical depth of both objectives and a weapon economy that gave Counter-Strike such a massive audience. Dust 2, Mirage, Train, Nuke and Inferno were all born in this era, and although they've all had several major reworkings over the years, if you only know the CSGO version you'd still be able to get about in the originals. Dust 2, yeah, admittedly does look like toddlers have broken in and scribbled crayon all over its textures, but it is still very recognisably Dust 2. The weapons haven't changed a bit either, they go by different names and look what scoping with a stare owl used to look like, mental, but it's more or less the same old armoury the pros play with in CSGO today. Lee and Cliff iterated quickly, racing through a series of beta releases in late 99 and 2000, and the audience just kept growing with every release. Eventually the bigwigs at Valve took notice. Valve bought the Counter-Strike IP in 2000 and released version 1.0 that September. Both Lee and Cliff maintained at least a degree of involvement after the buyout before eventually handing over total control to Valve. And for Valve, now the masters of Counter-Strike's destiny, the problem was obvious. Counter-Strike was a mod. Enemy spotted. It was totally free to download and play, as long as you owned Half-Life, and while that little detail was contributing to its enormous success, looking back they were obviously looking for how to monetize its popularity. The answer was Counter-Strike Condition Zero. Slated as a kind of soft sequel to the original mod and announced in 2001, it was going to be an improvement on the familiar multiplayer game which also brought single-player missions to the fray. Notice I'm saying was to be there. Because actually, what with one thing and another, swapping developers and flim-flamming on what Condition Zero was actually going to be, it didn't make it out into the shops until 2004, by which time the Gold Source engine looked more worn out than Manuel Pellegrini if he kept it up three nights in a row doing burpees. Right, let's, move. let's get the hell out of here. 
I mean, it still feels good to play, you know, it's Counter-Strike, of course it does, but it doesn't look that far removed from the previous version, does it? And to really seal its fate, Half-Life 2 was just months away now with its incredible new physics-based game engine, which meant Counter-Strike Source was too. It's not a total bust though, isn't Condition Zero? The idea of picking AI teammates was pretty compelling at the time, and since they all have different ratings for aspects like bravery and skill, it's a system with enough depth to keep you experimenting for a while. As for the single player stuff, well, you're looking at it right now and it's pretty much all like this to be honest. Yeah. It's available to play today in the form of deleted scenes on Steam. I wouldn't recommend doing so, but there it is. Best remembered as a bizarre moment when one of the most popular multiplayer games of all time felt the need for a solo campaign, Condition Zero didn't really move the chains along on the fundamental formula. RPG from 3 o'clock, evade! This is Red Tail 5. We've been hit and are going down. Red Tail 5 is going down. Okay, we're in 2004 now, November the 1st. Half-Life 2 has just arrived, and with it is a remake of Counter-Strike that looks lovely and feels just as... Well, there's no word for how great headshots feel here, so thank goodness we're talking about it in a visual medium. Look at that. Visceral poetry. I'm getting distracted. Counter-Strike Source was a massive leap forwards. And like Valve's new software distribution platform called Steam, Making it an inexorable part of buying Half-Life 2 was a canny move on Valve's part that really made sure CS remained popular as gaming entered this new, high-fidelity, physics-driven era. Again, if you've only played CSGO, you'll feel pretty at home here. Welcome back to Office. It's just as you left it. The hostages are still waiting patiently to be saved just like they were in 1999. They just look a bit more like hostages now and a bit less like those weird body pillows you see wish ads for when you scroll too far down your timeline. The weapon economy is just the same and although things like spray patterns and exact damage values are different about the guns, a lot of the same skills apply. This isn't a game about running around and firing indiscriminately and it never has been. Here in discontinued but treasured maps like Aztec and Havana, walking around quietly with shift, aiming for the head and firing in short bursts is the one. There was a lot of tinkering during the source years though. In 2006, Valve rolled out dynamic pricing, which changed weapon costs according to how in demand they were the previous week. It was supply and demand just like the real economic market, only with orcs acting as gold bullion. Yeah, and looking back, we're all thankful that didn't stick around for the long run, otherwise AKs would probably cost $20,000 each by now. And as we all know, that's only a sensible price tag for an entirely cosmetic weapon skin. We were already thinking about Counter-Strike as an old-timer in the late noughties, and that started to add to its value too. This wasn't a time of feverish nostalgia like we find ourselves in today, but something about playing those same maps you'd spent entire summer holidays in years before was unbelievably comforting. Counter-Strike was like coming back to the old family home and finding that the Noob Slayer 69 is still camping behind the coat rack, ready to deagle headshot you. Counter-Strike Source was so popular, so playable, and so perfect that when word got out in 2011 that Valve and Hidden Path were working on a new Counter-Strike game, the community's reaction was basically like this. All oh, right, apparently Valve and Hidden Path are working on a new Counter-Strike game. It was only originally intended as a console port, after all, finally letting the gamepad brigade in on the good stuff we'd been enjoying for all these years. But during development, Valve's ambitions for it changed, and the game that arrived in 2012 was a full-blooded title that added to and improved upon basically all of CS Source's aspects. Basically, the unthinkable happened. An enormous community migrated from one tried and tested game to a new home. And this great migration was helped along by a few business savvy ideas like the 2013 arms deal, which added weapon skins to the game. Yeah, that one worked out all right, didn't it, Valve? I remember thinking at the time that this somehow cheapened the game, seeing weapons we'd been using and honing our skills with for years suddenly daubed with gaudy designs like Need for Speed cars or something. It'll be a fad, I thought. And yet, seven years later, I'm proved as categorically wrong as anyone could be. My mate got an AWP skin a while ago that's currently selling for 1,000 actual pounds on Steam's market. 
Not all the old treasures have made it over. Cobble and Aztec, two of our personal all-time favours on the channel, aren't currently on the active duty roster, which means you can't play competitive matches on them. But what we have instead is intelligent matchmaking, new modes like arms race and flying scoutsmen, and limited time operations. At the time this is going out, there have been nine operations so far, and the first one, Operation Payback, came in 2013, not long after CSGO's release. Operations are a bit like Fortnite season passes, challenging you with specific in-game accomplishments with a hard deadline in exchange for cosmetic drops. Unlike Fortnite though, Operations also bring community-made maps into play, and some of these have become firm favourites, shout out to Seaside. And that is the hallmark of modern online gaming really, isn't it? This might be part of the secret to CSGO's enduring popularity, the way it blends absolutely ancient maps like Dust2 with new school mechanics like skins, loot boxes and a sense of progression that we need nowadays to keep plugging away at those headshots. So we've gone from Half-Life mod to stratosphere straddling esports giant in just um, two decades. Here's to many more Counter-Strike. And here's to many more Logitech G deep dives on the classic PC games you love. Let's hear your suggestions for what to cover next down in the comments, and leave us a like if you enjoyed this one. Remember to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and hit that notification bell so you never miss a vid from us. Catch you next time.